today for uh, for putting uh, this paper on the program. So this is a joint work with uh, with Alexander Dickerson and Philip Muller from Warwick Business School, and as well as Alexandre Janre from uh, UNSW. Uh, so in a nutshell, the objective, the main objective of uh, this research is um, to give insights about some of the driver of the co-movement between corporate bond and stock at the firm level. And, and, and the particular focus of this paper is to better understand the role of default risk in, in uh, driving uh, this co-movement. Co so when we go back to uh, the seminal paper of Merton 74, uh, one of the key takeaway from these papers that have been uh, used in many areas of uh, asset pricing, including all the derivative uh, literature is that, and the credit risk as well, is that both stocks and bonds can be seen as contingent claim written on the unlevered uh, firm assets. And basically what the model predicts is that both payoff of those two claims are positively related to the level of uh, the firm value. And thus, uh, we should expect a certain level of positive co movement between stock and corporate bond. Now, despite this really basic intuition about the relationship between stock and corporate bond, we know relatively little about the economic magnitude of this co movement and as well as the time series and cross-sectional variation, as well as the economic forces that uh, underlie such uh, co-movement. And, and perhaps one of, of the reasons why uh, we don't know that much about some of the factors driving uh, the dependence between stock and corporate bonds return is because when we come back to that seminal uh, a paper of Merton, uh, which has been the, 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 the de facto model to, to allow empiricists to give guidance to, to conduct empirical analysis as well as guidance to the subsequent series that one of the, the prediction of that model is that, or, and its imitation as well, is that stock and bonds within the framework of the model will be perfectly correlated. And now if we step back from this intuition or this limitation of the model and we look at the data, the co-movement between stock and corporate bonds is far from being constant nor perfect. And to give you, before going into the deeper and uh, the depth of our analysis to motivate a little bit uh, the extent of, you know, the fluctuation in time series wise and cross-sectional of the co-movement between uh, stock and corporate bond, uh, in the following figure, we present the, the, the value-weighted average of covariance in the panel A, as well as correlation in panel B of two types of firm. In blue, we have the specu speculative grade firm and in uh, the dash black line, the investment grade. So just to understand how we, order, we got uh, those graphs, basically, we know that at the firm level, there is usually multiple bonds that are issued. So most of our analysis going to be at the firm level and not the bond level. So we're going to first aggregate bond return by averaging them over every month to get one return observation for each firm. Having one return observation for bond for each firm and for the, the common stock of that firm, then most of our analysis is going to use simple rolling window estimates uh, to compute either covariance or correlation for each firm. And what you see in the graph is just once we rank firm, depending on whether they are speculative or investment grade, we just evaluate the uh, firm level uh, dependence measure and we plot it in those uh, two panels. So when you look at those panels, the first thing that is extremely striking is that there is independently of whether we consider covariance or correlation, there is quite a bit of, of time series fluctuation. And particularly, we see that during the, the crisis and turmoil period, we can see that in the 2008 and close to the COVID as well, we see quite a bit of, of action there. 
Now the cross-sectional uh, uh, variation, we can observe it by simply comparing the blue and the black line. And what you can see, for instance, if we look at the correlation case, you see that during periods that are relatively calm, usually that cross-sectional uh, uh, variation and spread between speculative and investment grade kind of tend to increase while it kind of shrink during a uh, market turmoil. And basically from this picture, what it seems that uh, it's pretty evident is the connection between the stock and the bond market is far from being trivial. And, 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 and therefore having a thorough analysis of some of the driver of the dependence between stock and bond is uh, very important, not only from an academic point of view, but also when you think about uh, investor and uh, practitioner, given the preponderance and the fundamental importance of exploiting cross-asset dependence to design sound and uh, portfolio allocation and risk management uh, practices, the uh, better understanding on the driver and economic factor influencing the dependence between bonds and stock is, is uh, critical. Okay, let, let me abuse my power as moderator to jump in and ask a question. Go ahead. So, so you set it up on like the first slide as thinking about as presenting the Merton model as the framework for thinking about these correlations. And obviously, you know, there are some limitations because the simple Merton model implies perfect correlation. But you know, my first reaction is, is while I recognize such models are hard to solve, right? A structural model with stochastic volatility seems like a more natural framework for thinking about this, right? Because, you know, shocks to underlying asset values, stocks and bonds should move together. Shocks to volatility, stocks and bonds should move in maybe in opposite directions and you know you know maybe d during different periods shocks to volatility are, are important and other periods shocks to asset value are important and i mean to me that seems like the natural framework for thinking about these correlations um and i i love uh, i love uh, this uh this um, this question and this reflection that you have on uh, the Merton model and basically the extension that you're thinking about, Neil, is, is exactly what we are doing in the theory. So in the theory, what we're going to do is uh, build a, a type of stochastic, an extension of the Merton model with stochastic volatility. And one of the points that we're going to make is that it's only when you're going to accommodate in this type of model another factor to which bond and stock have opposite exposure, just like variance. And I'll give you more insight about, even though uh, the insight that you gave me was, uh, was great, I'm going to come back on this insight. But indeed, it's as soon as you're going to uh, introduce factor to which bond and stock have opposite exposures and it's going to allow to break down uh, break down that perfect correlation. And this is exactly a, a model similar to what you have in mind that we are developing in the theoretical part of the paper later on. Um, so before talking a little bit about uh, the literature and how we differentiate, I would like to take just a moment to highlight really the key takeaway of this presentation. And you'll see that basically what I'm going to show you after that is just empirical analysis that point towards the, the, the statements that we're going to make now. Um, I believe that we have three main contributions uh, relative to existing work. The paper uh, is not on SSRN yet. It's going to be posted soon. And I'm looking forward to any comments that you may have uh, so that we can uh, accommodate them and address them before we post uh, the, the, the paper. But uh, the paper is, is um, drilled around two two components, an empirical one and a theoretical one. From the theoretical perspective, the first and I think key contribution is to show that uh, future stock corporate bond co-movement is extremely tightly linked to firm default risk. And what we mean, and not only in the time series, but in the cross-section. 
And what we mean by that is that when default risk of firm increase, the corporate bond of those firms tend to behave more like a stock contingent claim and thus the dependence and whether we talk about covariance or correlation between uh, the bonds of those firms and their stock start to increase. Not only in a contemporaneous way, we have some results about that, which are not in the main paper, but some robustness analysis, but in a predictive way. So we're gonna show that this relation between co-movement and default risk is extremely strong and default risk allow to predict future co-movement between stock and bond return. Now, obviously, you may think, well, if it predicts co-movement, then maybe we can make use to design a trading strategy. And this is exactly what we do in the second part of our empirical analysis. We're going to develop a very simple, simple conditional portfolio allocation type of, uh, type of uh, strategy where we're going to construct a balanced portfolio composed of stocks and bonds of firm either that are very risky or very credit worthy. And what we're going to find is that when we construct such a balanced portfolio, we, you're going to hear me today say balanced portfolio. What I mean by balanced portfolio is just a portfolio that is 50% invested in stock and 50% invested in bond. Well, when, when we're going to create such a portfolio, what we're going to see is that the balanced portfolio of stock and bond issued by the most credit worthy firm generate much lower total volatility because those firms, by mixing bonds and stock of those highly credit worthy firms, we can attain much more, much bigger diversification benefits. And as a result of that, those investments deliver very high export sharp ratios that are about twice the magnitude of uh, less and more risky uh, firm. So, I'll show you some, some, some results there in a, in a bit, in a few slides, but the economic magnitude of, uh, of the difference between um, the performance of the strategy is quite striking. So that's for the empirical part of two key contributions. From the theory point of view and related to, to what uh, Neil was uh, talking about, we're going to uh, have our main contribution is to develop a model that extends current, current uh, theory, theory or like the literature on credit risk and uh, that studies stocks and bonds. We're going to develop a model that is basically a stochastic volatility extension of Merton. And basically, the key ingredient of the model is going to be the following. We're going to have a factor structure. You'll see that we're going to use the model to simulate an entire cross-section of firm. And thus, we need for consistency to have a common factors that's going to drive the common fluctuation across all those firms, the common risk. We're going to have a common factor that's going to have stochastic volatility, but also firm going to be exposed to a idiosyncratic, uh, to idiosyncratic shock that's going to also have uh, stochastic volatility. Now, related to what we were discussing and the point of uh, Neil earlier, when you come back to, even though the model is a bit more fancy than Merton, you can always come back to the, this simpler framework to, to build intuition on what's going to going on in that more, uh, more complex model, I would say. Equity can be seen as a, a co-option on the firm asset, while bonds are short a put option. As a result, we know that from basic uh, uh, option pricing theories, and know, we know that call option have positive vega, put option have positive vega. If bond are short to put option, it means that the vega position is negative. In turn, what does it mean? It means that the exposure of bond to shock to variances is going to be negative while it is positive for equity. And because of this, it's going to allow to break down that perfect correlation. What I'm going to show you is that the model do a great job at matching many asset pricing moments of bonds and stock all together. Why it does a great job at doing this and also at matching some of the key stylized files that we document empirically, such as the positive relationship between co-movement and default risk, it fell by a large amount to generate 
the unconditional level of correlation and covariance between corporate bonds and stock. And we, we document basically it's a new finding of the, of the limitation of the structural risk literature. And we document and we, we refer to this finding as the correlation puzzle, which basically is for many years, the credit risk literature has deal with the credit risk puzzle, which is that model had trouble to generate sufficient credit spread. Now that that puzzle has been solved, among other things, using stochastic volatility model, what we show is that there is still room for improvement in the modeling framework because those models are still limitation and among other things related to the ability of generating um, a, a, a sensible uh, level of dependence between corporate bond return and stock return. So related to existing work, the, the literature is is can I can I break in with a question because yeah. it seems appropriate for the previous slide from Gustavo Schwenkler. Um, why do you exclude the market segmentation channel? Because it seems like a plausible additional explanation your, for your findings rationalizing the puzzle. It uh, it's it's uh, I, I think that's that's exactly the, the one of the that's exactly. I, I'm going to speculate a little bit on this, but I do agree with Gustavo, Gustavo that it's likely that this inability of the model to generate the unconditional low level of correlation is most likely due to some market segmentation. Also, it would be very interesting to pursue that road. I think you'll see already today, I try to go over all my slides, all the results. I think that extension is a great extension to pursue, but I think it's more uh, a future research avenue uh, type of uh, question. And uh, and I think the key message of our paper is, is really to show that even if you go to the state-of-the-art model without market segmentation, you can match all those facts, but you fail to match the, the unconditional level of correlation, which leaves the question of, why and potentially market segmentation is obviously a potential answer to that. Now, another point that I'm gonna to try to make is that also the model fell to generate the low unconditional level of dependence. It does a great job at generating the time series and cross-sectional variation in dependence, which are most likely not necessarily impacted by market segmentation. And thus, when I say a market segmentation channel is needed, it seems it would be more needed to be able to decrease the unconditional level of correlation, but not to explain the time series or the cross-sectional variation independence. Um, from a literature, I will not spend too much time here. Uh, and there is potentially people in the audience that have contributed to the stock and bond literature, and I, I excuse myself if you don't see your paper cited, there is a lot of great paper out there. I just selected a very selective uh, number of paper just to give you an idea, to give the audience that maybe is less familiar with this literature, the idea of the state of what's going on. So there is kind of mixed mix consensus about how you know, the stock market and the corporate bond market are related, which is obviously related to a research question because we try to understand the dependence between corporate bond and uh, stocks. So for instance, if we look at the two first paper of Kwan and Freewald and Al, what those papers show is that it seems that risk premia in credit risk markets kind of is informative about future stock return, which suggests there is some kind of commonality and integration between those markets, at least in terms of price of risk. Colin Dufresne and Al, give us a, a, a mix a mix type of, of view. Basically what they conclude, they, they conclude that stock return are not necessarily aligned with the changes in credit spread according to the structural model type of framework. So first type of paper, there is a relation. Colin Dufresne and Al seems to say, well, it seems that there is some limitation in our modeling framework, or at least the way we think about linking uh, the credit risk in the stock market. And 
uh, somewhat contradicting Colin Dufresne and Al, Zeri Schaefer and, and Strubulayev. And what they do in the paper that I think is well known, and most likely some of you know that paper, they look at the sensitivity of bond return to equity return, which they call edge ratio. And what they find is that structural model a la Merton do actually a great job at predicting the relationship between the two. Uh, finally, so it seems that bond return and stock return seems to be related to a certain extent, and it seems to be uh, related in a consistent way with the way we think about describing the data structurally. Finally, C uh, Cordia and Al or, 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 or Bali and Al, what they, they find is that they seem to have some kind of, 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 of segmentation, if I may say, or disagreement between stock and bond. So Cordia and Al find that stock market leads the bond market, and Bali and Al find use machine learning technique to predict bond and stock return, and they find that uh, basically you need different characteristics to predict uh, the two. And finally, there is that entire, related to Gustavo question, there is that entire literature about market segmentation, and there is many, many uh, good contributions in that literature. I will talk to that literature. I will not go to the detail of all the contribution of those papers. But related to all those papers, the key contribution of all paper is really to focus on the dependence between stock and bond, covariance and correlation, not in a contemporary way, but to show the predictability and the importance of default risk to predict this dependence, which we uh, quantify uh, economically speaking to propose a, a trading strategy that generate great, uh, great performance, and that is very simple, and to develop an entire framework that can rationalize uh, this, this findings. So let's go to the core bit of the analysis. Um, the, the data, very standard, is going to be trace, compute stats, crisp, we match. We get the, the about a cross section of about 1,500 firms. And what is important is that our uh, periods that we're going to cover with most of our results, we're going to show some results for an extension period is between 2002 and 2020. But what is important and particularly related to that trading strategy I was talking about, it's not a trading strategy of penny stocks. It's a trading strategy of bonds and stocks that cover 70% of the firm of the S&P 500. So it's something that is implementable. Finally, I'll show uh, it's a, not today, but I'm going to show some results today uh, where we have some robustness and analysis that starts in 87 instead of 2000. So in terms of the key measure, you'll see we have a lot of controls, but in terms of the key measure, you're going to see over and over for the next few slides, we have the following. In terms of dependence, we're going to have either covariance or correlation. In the paper, we always show the result for both. In, the, in terms of presentation, I'm going to focus a little bit uh, on correlation today. Uh, the benchmark specification is rolling window estimates. So we're going to have 12 months rolling window estimate of covariance and correlation. We have robustness results using more fancy estimates, such as DCC gauge correlation <clears throat> and covariance type of estimate. The result hold whether you use one or the other. So we opt for the most straightforward way to compute covariance and correlation for the benchmark analysis. Uh, in terms of default risk, we're going to focus on three different and well-spread uh, variable, market leverage, distance to default, and bond credit spread. In the paper, we show that the result hold for any one of them. But our main specification, or at least the benchmark specification, going to use what we call default risk, which is simply put an average of all of this, which we're going to standardize just so that the results are very uh, easily interpretable in terms of uh, economic magnitude. So without further ado, let me uh, go to the basically the main result of the paper. Subsequent to this table, I'm going to show a lot of robustness checks, but the main idea of the first contribution is here. So let me explain what we are doing here. We're going to basically 
panel A shows the result when the dependent variable, the co-movement is covariant. Panel B, when it's the Fisher correlation. So Fisher correlation is just uh, a standard way to, to transform correlation so that we can have statistical tests and we can make this stat, compute this stat and so forth. So, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna regress in panel setup, either panel of Fama Macbeth. We're gonna regress subsequent uh, co-movement measures that have been measured from months T plus one to T plus 12 against our default risk measures that is measured as of time T. In some specification, we're gonna have film fixed effect and, uh, and, and, and that's pretty much it. So let me take you through uh, the different specifications. So it's the same specification uh, in one is the same as four, two is the same as five, and three is the same as six. So if you look at here, first of all, for the panel specification, we're gonna, uh, we're gonna cluster standard error by months and firm with the uh, specification we, we consider. And the most stringent specification is number two and number five, where we have firm fixed effect. Here, we, we have no control. I'm gonna show you a lot of results subsequently with a lot of control. So what's the takeaway here? First of all, independent of the dependence measure we are looking at, we see that the statistical significance is very high. Not only the statistical significance is very high, but with one single variable of default risk, the R square, are not, not uh, ridiculous, I would say, are pretty, uh, pretty, uh, pretty high. So now in terms of economic magnitude, not only statistically significant, but it's, it's economically meaningful. To give you an idea for correlation, uh, one standard deviation in uh, increase in correlation, uh, increase co-movement correlation, to be honest. Uh, no, uh, one standard deviation increase in default risk, sorry increase correlation by about 30%. So it's economically uh, meaningful. So how to interpret that positive relationship between default risk and co-movement and future co-movement? Again, as the firm default risk uh, increase today, well, bond behave in the future more like the equity of the firm, more like stock contingent claim enters the co-movement between the bond and the stock increase in the future. So this is really the key message of, of, uh, of the paper. Now, some of you might say, well, let's see a little bit how this old when we start to add control. And in the following figure, we focus on correlation. As I say, most of the results gonna focus on correlation. The covariance results uh, are in the paper. When we're gonna post it, you will be able to look at it. But Basically, you see that independently of the control, I'm going to come back on the control, but independently, each, each column is different controls, except the eight that include all controls. So this is for the second specification where we use the panel with a film fix effect. So you can compare the result here with the result we obtain here. So you see that the loading is very stable independently of the control used. The R square is very stable independently of the control use. And here are the type of controls that we have, bone characteristic, whether they are callable or not, the time to maturity, so forth, so on, coupon, stock characteristics, stock liquidity, uh, market to book ratio, uh, the log, log of uh, market cap of the firm, liquidity risk with an aggregate liquidity factor, actually two the one of Pasteur and Stombo, and the one of Upan and Wang. It's also robust to intermediate risk of, uh, of A, Kelly, and Manila. It's also robust when you add sovereign information, sovereign curve information, and the slope, as well as the level of long-term yields and short-term yields. When you add expectation about inflation, when you have factors that capture macroeconomic uncertainty, and when you add all of them, as you can see, the R square is very stable and the coefficient loading is also very consistent across the specification. So to a certain extent, what we conclude from this table is that default risk matters a lot and is, is very important to actually predict how in the future, corporate bond and stock could move with each other. Now, what is not very easy to see from this type of test is 
what is the contribution truly of default risk? Maybe default risk is just a statistically significant, but does not really explain much of the cross-sectional and time series variation. Well, to address this question, what we do here, so let's focus on correlation, given that most of the result that I was presenting earlier was correlation, is we use a chape when r squared decomposition. And basically, what the idea of that type of decomposition, it just, it allows the econometrician to say something about which variable in his linear framework, is in his linear regression framework, matters the most to explain uh, to the fit of the regression. And here it's in a relative term. So for instance, when you look at bomb characteristic, you see that default risk explains 70%. It means that if I go back here, that 29% R square, well, 80%, 70% of it is explained by default risk. As you can see across all the, 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 the controls that I was talking on the previous slide, Default risk is by far the most economically speaking, the most important variable to actually explain uh, future movement of stocks and bonds. So more uh, robustness analysis, I, I'll go briefly about it, but I think we have been, or we have tried to be as thorough as possible to show that default risk is a very important variable. So let me just explain you a little bit what what's in that table. I know it's a lot of number, but let me try to give you just a quick idea. So here's the baseline. It just, we repeat what we had in the last column when we had all the controls. So the numbers that you see there are basically the numbers that you see here. And then we can compare, this will allow you to compare by eyeballing the table with different specification. So the baseline framework again is firm level, which means that we aggregate information of bonds to have only one return for each firm. Maybe you could say, well, this creates some kind of, of uh, or it wash out some kind of the information, maybe to not be robust to go at the bond level. Well, if we go at the bond level, nothing change. You see that still, still significant, R square a little bit lower because obviously when we aggregate return of bond, it allows us to wash a little bit of micro market microstructure effect and so forth and so on, but pretty, pretty robust. What if you take off all the bonds that have callables? Again, pretty robust. Now, let's go back to the firm level when we aggregate bond return as one, and let's exclude financial and utilities. Again, it's robust. What if you start in 87 instead of 2002? Again, nothing changed. DCC correlation instead of rolling window. We see that there is obviously the DCC correlation is a bit more noisy. So we see that the, the coefficient decrease a bit, but same type of R square, very significant. When we're going to fit the model, we're going to use CDS spread. Some of you would say, well, in your default risk measure, you have used market leverage, you have used uh, distance to default, but you didn't use CDS spread. Why? Well, we didn't really use CDS spread because when you use market information, which allows us to have the CDS spread data, it shrinks a lot the cross section. So here we just show that if we were to use CDS spread, we would get a similar result as well. What about persistence? So here in the control of this regression, we have something that potentially is persistent and we didn't really control for the lag. Well, if we control for the lag of past co-movement, whether it's here, it's correlation, but whether it's correlation or covariance, again, nothing changed. Finally, there is quite a bit of overlapping because it's monthly frequency of measurement, but we measure co-movement over 12, 12, 12 months. So there is quite a bit of dependency in our dependent variable. What if we go at the yearly horizon so that we kill any overlapping measurement? Again, of course, the, the coefficients, we lose a little bit of power, but again, the coefficient is like very close to the baseline uh, scenario. So again, what is the key takeaway here is that not only default risk matter a lot and has an economically uh, a big impact on, in order to predict future co-movement, but in addition to this, it's extremely robust. So 
Now, something that is a little bit hard to do with regression uh, without doing some ad hoc decomposition is to understand how is, whether the re relationship is truly linear or not. And to assess whether it is the relationship between default risk and future commitment is linear or not, in this figure, what we do is just we're going to sort firm every month. We sort them depending on the credit rating. And once we have assigned them to one of the buckets, basically, you see we have five buckets, like quantile type of sort, sort, sorting. We just put the co-movement measure, and then we're going to evaluate among every month among all the firms that have been put in the bucket. And then we take the average of that this time series for each bucket, and we report it here in uh, the graph. So what is really interesting here is that you see that, for instance, there is quite a bit of asymmetry. And let's focus on correlation. You see that it's kind of the same result for covariance. But what is the takeaway of that graph is that for more credit risky firm, a change in credit rating in terms of default risk has a much bigger impact on the dependence than fluctuation of default risk for more credit worthy firm. So to a certain extent, fluctuation in default risk is going to have an economically big impact on the dependence between stock and bonds of risky firm relative to a credit worthy firm. Let me, let me jump in. Um, <laughs> another question from Gustavo. Actually, I think it may be related to the previous slide, but if I if I screw up the question, Gustavo can jump in. Anyway, the question is, does it make sense to look at the dependence of this finding interacted with the level of intangible assets of a company? It seems to me that as the firm approaches default, the question of whether the bonds look more like the equity boils down to the question of whether the firm has assets that can be liquidated to pay off bondholders in bankruptcy court. So I'm wondering whether this is a really a story of default risk driving this correlation or whether it is more a story of firms with a lot of illiquid assets versus firms uh, with, well, for, for, story of firms so, so, with yeah. liquid assets or not. Yeah. So. Uh... So I think it's a it's a very good point. Uh, I, I I would say that we are concealing in some way all of this uh, all of this uh, effect in one measure. I do agree with Gustavo that it's likely that if we go more at the micro firm level, uh, uh, knowing whether bond as collateral or not, then uh, obviously affects the way uh, the 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 bond, uh, the bond default risk gonna matter in terms of future co-movements in the sense that firms that bonds that are more well collateralized are more likely to respond less to a change in default risk and thus the co-movement between this bond and the stock of the company is less likely to increase. So it's, it's, it's a fair point to say um, I, I do think that our results would hold for controlling for this type of collateralization. Uh, uh, I, I think this is something that we, we could think about, about another uh, robustness check about trying to disentangle which bond have collateral, which, which have not, and look at a little bit to which extent this affects the relationship we are uh, describing in this table. It's a, it's a great suggestion. Really. We'll try to see if we can do something about it. Did I answer the question? Well, I, I'll let Gustavo re-ask re if it didn't. There was also some discussion that in the chat that actually doesn't require a response now. So given the time, I won't read it to you. Um, I, I other thing, I'd like to call your attention to the time. We have a hard mm -hmm. stop in 20 minutes. That's fine. Uh, today, I, I think I wanted to put the uh, most effort in, in the empirics, and I'm just going to give you a highlight of the model. For those of you that are interested, uh, the paper is going to be posted soon, so you can have uh, a look at it. Uh, in the interest of time, I will not discuss too uh, much about it, but it's another way to see robustness checks. So what we do is uh, we regress in the spirit of Schiffer and Shrabulayev. We look at edge ratio. 
and basically we regress bond return on stock return, as well as the interaction of stock return and lag default risk and default risk on its own plus all the control. And what we see is that the interaction term and default risk is always significant and load significantly. What does it mean? It means that the edge ratio increased with default risk, which again is consistent with the previous result where we think that as uh, default risk of the firm increased, bond behave more like uh, the stock. And we can see that the interaction of the two uh, matters more. So uh, now let's see if we can make use of this for the trading strategy. And the trading strategy is going to be extremely simple. So what we're going to do is we're going to form each month's portfolio depending on the default risk of firm. Now we're going to classify firm, rank them in quantile portfolio depending on the level of default risk. And once we're going to do this, we're going to do the following. Suppose that we have identified on a given month all the firms that go in uh, Q1, which is a compile one. Then we're going to evaluate the stock of the, the return of the stock of the firm. And we're going to evaluate the return of the bond of the firm. We're going to repeat that exercise for all the quantile for every month. So at the end of the exercise, for a given quantile, we have an entire time series of the return, evaluated return of the stocks of the firms that pull in that quantile and of the bonds. And then what we're going to do is basically just do a 50% 50, 50 allocation, so a balanced strategy where we put 50% in the stock portfolio and 50% in the bond. And what we're going to compute is what we call uh, 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 diversification benefit, which leverage previous study, Godsman and Al, 2005. And basically, the, the diversification benefit variable boiled down to this. And what's the intuition here? Suppose that there is more correlation between the portfolio of stock and bond, thus covariance increase. If this guy increase because there is a minus uh, in front, then diversification benefit going to decrease. If this guy decrease, then diversification benefit going to increase. So this is basically what we do. And here, what we show is the result for Q1, which is the low default risk quantile, Q5, the high default risk quantile. So in the interest of time, I'm going to just take you through the key uh, result. First of all, look at how a balanced strategy of very safe firm the sharp ratio it delivers relative to the more risky firm. Why the return on the more risky firm is higher than the return on the less risky firm. But the diversification benefits in terms of volatility basically offset the lower return, which results in much higher sharp ratio. And basically, if you look at uh, the diversification benefit variables that I was discussing earlier, you see that it monistically increased with the quantile. And another way to look at or to see that diversification benefit is to compute the sample correlation of the bond and the stock portfolios that constitute the balance strategy. And you see that for safe firm, very low correlation, and for uh, risky firm, uh, higher correlation. Then we do an exercise that I think is very interesting is that in in panel C and D, what we do is let's switch either the stock portfolio or either the bond portfolio in each of those contacts by an index. So for instance, in panel C, what we do is we leave the stocks that have been ranked in each of those contacts and we switch the bond return for each contact by a large bond index. And we construct a 50% 50, 50 strategy and we look at diversification benefit. You see that stocks don't really react to default risk. In contrast, what we see is that when we do the same exercise but mirror image, we switch the stock following in a given quantile by a large index of, of a large stock index, we see that the diversification benefit is kind of similar to what we have in the baseline uh, baseline strategy. And what does this mean to me? It means that default risk is really a corporate bond market type of effect and that the stock market does not really uh, react that much to uh, change in default risk of, of, uh, of the company. So uh, in terms of theory, 
I'm going to go rather quickly again. Uh, it's relatively simple. It builds. So what the key insight is, we're going to extend Leland and uh, Merton type of model to have stochastic volatility. It's an extension of Du Elkami and Ericsson 2019, where we allow for a factor structure and we decompose total volatility into a systematic and an idiosyncratic part. So basic idea, we're going to have a common factor. Y here is going to drive the common source of asset risk across all firms and as stochastic volatility, which is going to be priced. So this is going to drive the common factor in basically firm unlevered firm uh, asset return. So the unlevered firm asset return, so firm I, going to have a factor structure in the spirit of CAPM, loading on that common, common factor, and has also idiosyncratic risk, which has also stochastic volatility, but is not priced, meaning that uh, basically the, the, the SDF is not function of, on any of those uh, firm-specific type of shock. So while the total variance of the firm I going to be very close to the standard type of LZ factor framework, I'm going to show you that in terms of covariance, the model is going to give very rich implication. In terms of SDF, we're going to need to price bond and stock. So we need to specify your SDF. We follow the standard derivative asset pricing literature. SDF is exponentially affine in the two systematic shocks. And basically, we have the variance risk here, systematic variance risk, and the, the, the risk that is unrelated to variance that can be priced in that framework. Then what we do is reprice bonds and stock on the firm. So it's a perpetual bond when firm default because the asset uh, touch the exogenous boundary XB. Uh, basically, the firm default, there is some cost to this liquidation cost, and this is really the, it's very much like Leland result, except that the PD here, the arrow price of uh, default, going to be defined by our model, but the form of the result is really like the Leland type of model. So now that we have the price, we can apply it all, derive the return dynamic, and then once we have the return dynamic, we can look at that covariance and, and, and correlation. Here I show the result for correlation. What is great here is that the model allows us to get more insight about what drives the covariance. And what we see is that just like Merton type of model, we have asset risk, which is nothing else than the product of uh, stock and bond leverage multiplied by the instantaneous variance of the firm. And then we have those two additional factors, which we call variance risk, the product of stock and bond exposure to systematic variance or idiosyncratic variance time vol of vol, the variance of the variance, which is the variance risk channel. This is positive, this is negative. So the product of the two are negative. So that gonna be negative. This is positive. And the cost risk channel, which just captures the way the return on the asset come with market variance. This is negative, so the sign of this is going to be defined by the product of the two, which one dominates. This guy is positive, this guy is positive, so this guy is positive, but this guy is negative. This is negative, this is positive, and what we found is that this, this combination dominates much more than this one. So when we look at costliness risk, the sign of it is really defined by the product of stock leverage time, the exposure of bond, to variance risk. And so basically, again, this is those terms that's going to particularly the variance risk that's going to allow to break down that perfect correlation. So what we do is we're going to generate a large economy. We're going to use the model, generate a, a, an economy, a cross section of 1,500 firms over 10 years, compute the return of bonds of stock. Each firm has one stock and one bond. We're going to use the model to compute the different uh, uh, moments that we use to find the parameter of a model, and the moments that we are using are presented in panel A, leverage, CDS spread, physical probability of default, stock return volatility, bond return total volatility, systematic variance ratio in bond and stock, as well as the aggregate volatility of stock and bonds, so the aggregate volatility of large diversified stock portfolio and bond portfolio. When you look at the data versus the model, and the ratio of the two is an indicator 
you see very close to one that the model does a very good job at matching those moments. And in addition to this, the model also do a very good job at generating standard deviations that are close to the data. This is not perfect, obviously, nobody would expect one everywhere. And this has not been part of the estimation at all. It's really an output of the optimization, but we see that it's, it's fairly good. Basically, the model match the mean of the moments, and as well as kind of the standard deviation. When it does that perfectly, it fell by large amount to match out of sample the level of covariance and the level of correlation. Basically, the level of both in the model is about three times too big relative to, uh, to uh, the one in the data. And this is what we refer to the correlation puzzle. Why the model failed to match that unconditional level, we see that it's not too bad in terms of standard deviation. So what we do next, in simply we take a model and we rerun that baseline without any control baseline regression. And here you have what we got with the data for covariance and correlation and what we got with the model. And as you can see, also the model has smaller coefficient because the model fell a little bit to generate enough cross-sectional variation in the measure of covariance or correlation. It does a pretty good job if you could look at the R square at matching what uh, the data are telling us. So the model seems to be very consistent in terms of the level of default risk related to future co-movement of stock and uh, corporate bond. Now, related to the question Gustavo was asking, obviously our model failed to, to generate uh, the unconditional level of correlation, which we uh, label the correlation puzzle, and it seems that segmentation, market segmentation, could help resolve that puzzle. Now, which type of market segmentation? We are completely silent about it, and I think it's actually would be a great avenue for future research and theoretical work, theoretical and empirical, to give us an idea where in those type of models that have succeedly solved the credit spread puzzle, why do they fail to capture relatively well the dependence between, between corporate bond and stock? So this is really something that I see. I hope going to get some attraction from the theoretical structural uh, literature of credit risk. So now we can use the model, and this is a bit where I'm going to finish. Uh, we can use the model to actually, using the simulation economy, we can, again, construct quantile based on the default risk measure, and then look at how covariance is decomposed between its, res uh, its uh, respective uh, components. If you come back on the model prediction, here, you see that there is three types of components, asset risk, which is similar to the Merton type of, of, uh, of exposure. We have variance risk, which come from the higher order uh, variance distribution, so variance of variance, if I may say, and as well as co coskewness risk, which is the way how uh, the return on the asset can move with aggregate variance. And we basically, what we're going to do is we have this estimate in the simulation for each firm, and then we're going to look at what is, when we look at this estimate, what is the relative proportion of the three components to try to get some insight about, about how does, for different level of default risk, which component matter and which component matter less. So here it's in terms of uh, quantitative, it's not in terms of relative term, it's really in terms of uh, quantity. So maybe let's focus on the decomposition and the percentage term of covariance and correlation. And something that I think is really interesting and echo, uh, echoes some of the results of uh, some other paper is that what we see is that the higher order risk, which is a combination of variance risk and cost covariance risk, matter more to explain the covariance of more credit worthy firm than it does for less credit worthy firm where the model is almost a Merton Bolden or the covariance is almost entirely driven by the Merton type of framework. However, Albeat remembers that even though asset risk is a component that would come into a Merton or Leland type of framework, 
Here we have stochastic volatility, which means that there is still quite a bit of traction in the instantaneous variance of uh, unlevered uh, film returns that will come from this channel. So also asset risk is preponderant for more risky firm. Uh, we see that as film become more and more and more safe, the, the other components that are more terrorist type of components start to play a bigger role in driving the covariance uh, and the correlation of this between stock and bond of the sphere. So I'm going to try to conclude here. So what do we do? We, the paper show that study the, the, the role of default risk in uh, predicting future movement of stock and corporate bond. We show that default risk is one of the key variables that you can think of to explain future co-movement. Not only we show that it's extremely robust and economically meaningful, but we also show that this can be exploited in a very simple trading strategy uh, that basically mix stock and bond together. And by simply investing in a balanced portfolio of stock and bond of a uh, very uh, safe firm, uh, we can attain quite to high sharp ratio without any fancy uh, estimation or anything uh, like that. And with variables and sorting variable based on variables that are really uh, 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 computed and available to investors. The theoretical part of the paper, well, we develop a stochastic volatility models that extend uh, the framework of Elkami, uh, Ericsson, and uh, Du and Ericsson. And what we show is that the model uh, having stochastic volatility is critical to be able to generate sufficient time series and cross-sectional variation in order to match uh, the pattern in the data and the relationship between default risk and uh, stock and bond future co-movement. However, we also show that even if the model do a great job at matching so many moments, we see that the model also falls very short in terms of generating a sufficiently low level of uh, unconditional correlation between stock and bond, which I think would be a great avenue for future research, both empirical and uh, theoretical. So I'm going to finish here. All right, thanks very much. At this point, um, anyone should feel free to unmute yourself and use your microphone to ask your question. So right now, feel free to ask any question that you have. While people are thinking about the questions, I will, um, there were some comments in the chat that I'll read to math. So from Bjorn, uh, my guess is that, uh, is that the cross-sectional difference in factor exposures for firms with different credit ratings is consistent with a structural model. Uh, in bear markets with high volatility, riskier firms approach the default boundary and their assets values are more sensitive to cash flow and volatility risks. Um, I don't know if you feel free to respond to that if you want to, though it wasn't a question, so it doesn't yeah, really it need a response. Yeah, it's a small statement. I think, uh, I think Bjorn, you have... Uh... The, I think the right intuition about uh, about it. Uh, Matthew, this is Loren. Following up on Bjorn's comments and earlier Dimitri's comment, I feel like uh, you can do the second part simpler. Just think of a simple merchant model. Essentially, bond and uh, stock, they all have positive delta exposure to the asset value, uh, but they have opposite directions of big exposure. So I wonder if I just run, you know, stock returns and bond returns as your target variable, just run against a simple measure of their delta and uh, big exposure, because for far out of money options, they have the same vega, their correlation so, should go the opposite way, right? Because one is long, the other is short. So but when get, they're close to the middle, then their delta will dominate, and that's positive co movement. So uh, that's a great uh, suggestion, Lauren. Um, mm -hmm. Now, uh, I, I'm not sure we're going to do it in this paper, but I'm working on another paper and uh, that study together the cross section of stock and bonds. And this is what you're suggesting is what we do. And you clearly see what you actually 
uh, saying is that uh, across, for instance, different uh, default risk quanti, you're going to see if you use a variance like an invert VIX, change in VIX, or something like this, you're going to see that the exposure of, uh, of bonds is negative relative to stock. But in addition to this, the, 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 in terms of quantitatively speaking, uh, bonds of firms that are more uh, uh, risky have much more exposure to bonds than uh, the other, which relate to the Bjorn comment earlier. So your intuition is exactly right. And a cross-sectional regression of that sort actually gave you three portfolios, right? A Delta portfolio, a Vega portfolio, and also the idiosyncratic sort of portfolio. So that could be a like simple, nice way of separating their you know, uh, structure. That could be, that could be uh, I think, I, think I, I agree with you that it could be done in a, uh, in a, a regression uh, way. Something that I think is kind of cool is that uh, that message that you know the structural literature which has solved the credit uh, credit spread puzzle has still some work to do and think about and something to think about uh, and 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 this I think it's a it's a nice takeaway from uh, that uh, uh, theoretical exercise that we performed. So yeah, I have a question. Go ahead, please. Yeah, 